Please welcome Mr. Alex Lifeson. <laughs> wow. I, uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, shut up. <laughs> thank you so much. It's really awesome that we get to get together. We've all been on a long journey together, and it's pretty cool that we're at this point with Getty with his uh, book. With, I guess you've read the book? Yeah. yeah. We're going to have a great time tonight. We're going to have a great, lots of great stories. And, and, uh, and I'm going to ask Getty now to please come out and join me in my show. <laughs> come on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> ah. Hello. Hello, have you met my friend here? Have you met my BFF? <laughs> now don't make me cry before we even start. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, <laughs> you haven't felt this love in a while. No, right? it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. And on this stage yet. That's right. When yeah. were we here first? I think the first time we were here was almost 50 years ago, 49 years ago. Yeah. 1974, November 74. Yep, opening for? Uh, Nazareth. That's right. Yeah, see? I have a good memory. This is great tonight because, you know, there's this thing called memory, which I've learned a lot about. And uh, looking back to write about your life, you have memories of, excuse me, I'm talking. Uh, we have memories of certain moments, and we've talked about this, yeah. how we'll be in the same room experiencing the same thing, but we have different memories of that thing because our memories are imbued with our emotions, and we remember things differently. So tonight right. is like heaven for me because we can fill in all each other's gaps. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Good night. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Lex. Shall we sit? Shall we sit? Let's sit. So what do we do now? What do you want to talk about? Uh, We've only been together, hanging around with each other for how many years? I know. Well... We were what? 14, 15? 13, we I think, when we met. 13. Yeah. We were 13 once. Yeah. 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 And we're what? 42 now? So... <laughs> we, it's, That's perfect. It's been 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. I hate math. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you still seem so well preserved. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. I do drink a lot of formaldehyde. And, do, you, <laughs> uh, do you remember the first time you ever saw me? It was at school. It was at junior high mm -hmm. at R.J. Lang. That's right. Yeah. In North York. Yeah. I think. I, I think you were being beaten up th at the time, <laughs> and I was running through the woods to, <laughs> to get away. So you were helping, oh, as, helping usual. As, as I often do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I think it was at R.J. Lang in, yeah. in the hallway. I, I remember the first time I saw you was in R.J. Lang and you were wearing a purple and white paisley shirt yes. with a fink hook on the back. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah, thing that yeah fink hook, back. yeah. And I, then I befriended a chap named Steve Shutt. Do you, do you know that name? And... Steve and I, and actually I was very thankful to befriend Steve Shutt because, if you recall, he was a budding young hockey player even back then yeah. and very well respected by everyone at the school. And at the time, I was one of the kids that was bussed into R.J. Lang from the new um, suburb, which was mostly Jewish kids. And they weren't taken too kindly to Jewish kids at that school, so whenever we walked from the parking lot, the bus to the school, it was a bit of a gauntlet we right. had to kind of run. And for some reason, Steve befriended me, and because he was such a cool guy, people just left me alone mm -hmm. after that. So thank you, Steve. I was very grateful for that. Uh, but 
more importantly, we connected about music. And he used to say to me, uh, you see, we both bought bass guitars at the same time. There used to be a band in Toronto called the Poppers. Do you remember the Poppers? You probably don't, you're way too young. Uh, but they had this bass player, Denny Girard, who both Steve and I really admired. And after we saw them at North York Centennial Arena, yeah. we, we went, we decided we both needed to play bass. So we both took bass up. Didn't work out for him. Uh, yeah. But he had this hockey stick that right. he, he really knew how to yeah, use. Yeah, and you were a shitty hockey player. Yes, I was. Way, so. <laughs> That's true. But I was very good at skating on my ankles. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, so as I got better on the bass, he said to me, you have to meet this guy, Alex. I can't pronounce his last name. I think it's Eat a Sandwich. Uh, I think he called you Alex Eat a yeah. Sandwich. Yep. <laughs> and I said, oh, that guy, the blonde guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he introduced us, really. Mm -hmm. and, and that elasticity. Yes, they say. I mean, I, we wouldn't be sitting here making bad jokes if it wasn't for Steve. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but we don't have a Stanley Cup ring, though. That's, no, we don't. And he that's has one of the things. More than one. Yeah, yeah he does. So yeah. we ended up being failures, but Shuddy <laughs> got it done. <laughs> Shuddy won the cup, eh? He won the cup and the car and the whole oh, thing. That's eh? right. Yeah. It's a good machine, huh? That's a good machine. You uh, shoot the puck in the corner and then you take you the body. You score the goal and you get the car. That's right, exactly right. Yep. Oh, there's people here too. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot for a second. <laughs> uh, it's really unusual that Alex and I should be... I don't even call you Alex, but I'll, 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 I'll use the proper form tonight. Okay. That Alex and I are sitting here without at least a glass of wine in front of us. Or so. a guitar. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that too. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Uh, do you, Do you remember the, the the gig that we played here? I, I guess you probably don't. Do you remember the the gig? No. Which gig do you mean? Now? When we played here, the, the, well, the first time with Nazareth. With Nazareth, I only remember I was really nervous backstage yeah. before we came out because I had come to to this building to see so many bands as you have. Yeah. I sat right there to see the Cream play in 1968, yeah. right in that balcony, and so many bands. So yeah. I was, the honest of the place, the awesomeness of the place really did freak me out a bit before yeah. we came out. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly the same for me. Did you feel that way tonight when you came out here? Uh, well, knowing, well, once you barged into my dressing room. That was my dressing room. I know, but. You're the what? opening act. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was thinking of those gigs, and you know, we we played here so many times, and been here so many times. Like you say, I know I sat in that first row in the first balcony for so many shows. But um, when we recorded our first live album here, I remember right. how exciting that was. Yeah. You know, because really playing here with Nazareth was nerve-wracking. We finally got it to Massey Hall, and, uh, but doing our first headline gig, and yeah. it, w it was a really was exciting time. And, we, and the yeah. tape machine was rolling. Mm -hmm. And when you know the tape machine is rolling, you get tight. Uh, it's just a fact of life. Sure. And so every tiny mistake you make in your brain is amplified, like yeah. error, 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 right. starts flashing. Yeah, so quickly, make another one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know that feeling really, really well. You're good at that, you're night. really excellent at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, what are you gonna ask me now, Big Shot? I don't know. You're supposed to ask me about my, my effing book. Oh yeah, your effing book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, did, I did get to read his, his book. Um, you were the first person. I got a, to. yes, I got a, 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 an early copy. We wanted to, I think Ed wanted to make sure that he got his stories mostly right. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you didn't hate me afterwards. Yeah. And, and just to read it. And I got to say that, and I'm not just saying this because you're here. Okay. Um, so I'll look the other way. But I've, I loved the book. I really loved. Thank I you. I mean, obviously, I'm connected to a lot of the stories when we were kids and at your place and of course the band and, and all of that. But I found that I was laughing out loud so often reading the book and I cried oh. and I was just so focused and mesmerized by some of the stories and 
the flow of the writing itself. I, I didn't know you were that talented. Well, I'm glad you felt that way yeah. because it was very important for me, obviously, that you approved of the work because you're all over it. Yeah. You know, my, my story has you sitting beside me through most of it, right? Yeah. And, and even today. Even today. Isn't that amazing? It is, really. ama it is amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You know. It's, so it was very important to me that, that uh, you felt I had done right by you, but more importantly, us and the story of our band and yeah. our life together, especially through the, the great years, which were fun to write about. Yes. You know, writing about 74 and 75 and traveling across the country in a station wagon and sleeping on baggage and waking up and you were in the front seat beside uh, Howard, who's here tonight, and was driving across the country and there's all these corkscrews and knives sticking into the tar of the car somehow. Uh, you know, uh, or the story of us driving three hours the wrong way to Cleveland on the highway because we maybe smoked a few too many joints, it's possible, <laughs> has been known to happen. Uh, so those kind of stories are so much, were so much fun to remember. Yeah. But when we got through the difficult years, of course, and, and uh, after 97, when tragedy struck Neil's life and, and dealing with some of that, I had to be very um, respectful and delicate, and I just wanted to make sure that you felt that way about how it was written. And of course, telling the story of the last number of years, because many people yeah. really don't know what went down in those years. Um, you guys remember the last gig, August of uh, 2015, but there was stuff going on, obviously, through our own feelings uh, right. about how the band ended, and, right. and then dealing with the news of Neil's illness. Yeah. So, um, it was harder to write that stuff. I bet it was. Yeah, yeah those were very emotional times. Yeah. I know in that tour, the tour was so great. You know, the whole construct of the tour was mm -hmm. just so much fun yeah you know going back from the previous tour all all the way back to the beginning and then mm -hmm. the stage reflecting that that change and it just worked so beautifully and i thought we played so well on that tour as well yeah, i thought we did as well yeah yeah thank you maybe they did too yeah you know it, it's funny because a lot of times um and, and this happens, I think, with a lot of bands. The audience is so caught up, they're, especially if they're fans, they want to hear the music, they're, they love the whole experience of being there, and they just take it all in, and it's great. And in your mind on stage, you go, ah, that's one of the worst nights I've ever played. <laughs> I made so many stupid mistakes. You know, you're, you're so critical. Yeah, well, especially you, right? Yeah, no, I'm, when I'm thinking about you guys, but <laughs> yeah, I never wanted to say anything. <laughs> So this is a good time to really get okay, it out. get it off yeah. your chest now. <laughs> but I thought on that tour we had more really, really good nights than, you know, those sort of bumpy, lumpy nights. Yeah. And it was, and I know towards the end we just became sadder yeah. that it was coming to a close. And I think if we'd done maybe 20 more dates yeah. something close, closer to what we were doing previously, it would have been a little more satisfying, but I, I think we both felt sad. Well, yeah, and you know, I was trying to write and explain to these folks that as we got closer to the end, and really for the first time in our whole history with Neil, we were of two minds, you know. You and I were getting, as you said, sadder, but Neil was getting happier because he had made this decision to retire, to spend his life with, you know, his new family. And that's completely understandable, but it couldn't, we couldn't help but be affected by the fact that something was coming to an end without really wanting it to come to an end. Yeah. And so the last gig was strange, and I, I don't know how you remember it, but my memory of the last gig was that, you know, we were in the dressing room and it was kind of tough because we knew we might be going out there for the last time, even though we held hope that Neil would change his mind in two months, maybe get bored of being home and come back. But, and his dressing room was like ebullient. It was a party. It was a celebration of a, a career. So, and then 
we had this after party, and a lot of our friends were there. But I kind of felt like I was going through the motions at that party because mm -hmm. I was so my emotions were so mixed. I don't know how you felt. Yeah. And then we never talked with Neil afterwards. Yeah. And then it, we just went our separate ways. And I remember the plane ride home the next day was not a joyful no. plane ride, but partly because we stayed up most of the night drinking, but that was yeah. a whole other story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I threw up on those shoes too. Was oh, so was it these ones? Yeah. yeah. That's why they're this color. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they used to be white, hell. I think. Yeah, there was a lot of wine that night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, the aftermath of that tour was odd because yeah. we were working on uh, the video for our 40. And yet we weren't really communicating with Neil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I tell the story in the book how I had listened to the drum solo he had chosen. And I was so blown away by it that I just decided, fuck it, I'm going to write him and tell him that. So I wrote him this email and said, hey man, I don't know how it's going for you there, but we're just working on this film and I wanted to know which night you used for the drum solo because it was so perfect. You, really hit it out of the park. And then he just opened up. He wrote me back and he just opened up about, you know, his frustrations, about how he thought he had built this great drum solo, but he, nobody had ever told him that. And I thought that was such an odd thing that he still needed reassurance from you and I, even though we just took it for granted that he's fucking Neil Peart, that he knows right. how amazing yeah. he is. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, uh, and then he, he wrote about uh, the fact that he was the librarian at Olivia's school and this was making him really happy. Yeah. And I thought to myself, what the fuck do I have to be resentful about, you know? Yeah. He has earned a new life, you know? He earned it. And I have no business harboring any resentment for the way it came. Yeah. We got. 40 great years yeah. together. So. That's amazing. Yeah. So I don't know if you were feeling the same way. I think you, I think you felt a, a, a little uh, more strongly about it. I think um, I, th I, I was disappointed and saddened by it. But once we got some distance from it, I started to feel better and finding other things in my life. And, right. you know, I was still playing and still interested in, in writing some music and working on some music, you know, did a couple little projects along the way uh, for that, I guess, for that year afterwards. And then we found out that, that Neil was ill. And then it was an enormous burden to keep that a secret as, yeah, as he wanted. It really was. And you felt like you were lying to your, you know, to your friends or anybody ever Well, we asked. were. And we were lying because... Oh, we, it seemed like it. So I guess it, we were. Yes, we were. <laughs> we were actually lying. Yeah. I mean, you have to remember that it was very important for Neil, for no one to know about it. Yeah. Uh, he took that decision and we had no choice but to respect it and, right. be, and choose loyalty over honesty. And I really believe that was the right thing to do, as difficult as it was. But at first, you know, he was... Um, you can clap. <laughs> um, you know, he was, he was given 18 months at best. Yeah. And yet he's such a, he was such a bull, such a strong guy that he lasted three and a half years. So who would have expected, yeah. you know, to have to carry on with that charade for three and a half years. And after a while it became hard, it became difficult. Yeah. So when he did pass, you know, which, which was terrible and, uh, Shortly afterwards, we came home, and I was left with these feelings, uh, these feelings of grief that were mixed with all kinds of emotions. And that's when the pandemic hit, and suddenly we were locked down, and I was very aware of my mom, for example, who was uh, really struggling with uh, dementia. And so I was in a real funk. Yeah. And I don't know how you were during that early part of the pandemic, but for me, it eventually drove me to write and to look into my past to try to write this book after being spurred on by Daniel, uh, Daniel Richler, who's my co-writer and good friend. And uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Daniel. And he started writing me um, short stories about his dad, of course, the great Mordecai Richler. Uh, and uh, he would write a short note and he would say, why don't you write a memory? Write it back to me. And so I would write a little short note and it became a sort of a way to kill the time in lockdown. Uh, but mine, of course, got longer because you know me, I yeah. like to talk too much. And he said, I think you're writing a book and I think you should write a book. And I said, okay, as long as you help me. But that process was really healing for me yeah. and cathartic for me. And I needed to do it for so many reasons like that. But you seem to, to have this resilience, this brighter outlook that I was always jealous of, you know, that you could, you know, take these cataclysmic moments and put them in perspective more quickly than I could. Well, How do I'm, you do that? I, I'm a very shallow person. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, uh, I move on. You know, this, this is the... <laughs> this you, is, you're shallow and empty and have no ideas and nothing interesting to say. Yes, is that what you're saying? That's me, completely. <laughs> this is why we've always worked so well together. Because you are that guy who's very methodical. You've got to do everything you've got to know everything that's wrong before you know that it's right and you go through a, a process and I'm the opposite of that I lose not that I lose interest I just get impatient mm -hmm. and I want to get on yeah. and that's why we work well together in yeah. writing you you corral me when I'm like that all, right. all the good stuff comes out very very quickly and then I'm sort of yeah well this gentleman is a spontaneous genius I mean you really are. <clears throat> I don't know how many times... <laughs> I don't know how many times we sit down to jam and he plays something and I'm like, what the fuck is that? Wait, 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 stop. That was amazing. And he'll go, what? Yeah, I don't know. I go, no, that thing you just played, what thing? You know, that thing you just played, those eight notes in a row were a brilliant cluster. And I go, oh, okay. And if I hadn't recorded it yeah. and played it back for you, so you could relearn it, it would be, it would be gone to the ether. I know, so many times yeah. like that. Yeah, but that's, that's who you are. You're just innately creative and you, it comes out in wonderful bursts. And I've been fortunate enough to sit beside you with a tape recorder all these years <laughs> and to grab those bursts. And then my job is to try to add my two cents and harness it and then off we go. And, uh, I yeah. think it's worked out pretty well for yeah, us. Yeah, it has worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Do you remember opening <laughs> for... Do you remember opening for Hawkwind? Oh. I... I do remember opening for Hawkwind. I remember the last show that we did with Hawkwind. Why don't you tell these fine folks about the last show? Well, you know, they were, they were kind of a hippie band mm. of the time. And uh, they were, you know, sort of a jammy. The material was very much like that jammy and, and they sort of trip out on, on their stuff. So, we, I know on the last show, we just thought it was appropriate to give them a gift right. uh, uh, on that last day as, as we were moving on. And I enjoyed creating these small aircraft for Zone Airways, right. where I'd use nine papers right. and maybe... A now, what, were the, what was the essence of these little aircrafts? What well, was inside the little aircraft? Well, I'm getting to that. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. The essence was they were going to get you they are. They are. So I, I would c create these little aircraft with, as I said, the nine papers and, I don't know, three quarters of an ounce of pot, maybe? <laughs> it, yeah, pretty so much. It was a big, yeah, yeah. You know, this, this big was, fuselage. This like, was a... Talk about a jumbo this jet. Was, <laughs> this was a rocket ship. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> I loved making those things. They were yeah. so much fun. And of course, there's, once, there's a rocket. 
Yeah, that, that is, yeah, well, that's one of the rockets. Zone, zone Airways. Yep, yep. And, uh, and there's the, what's remaining of yeah. that first rocket. Yes, yeah, see, gets you there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, then here's one in flight. Yeah. <laughs> and it was great. At Toronto Sound Studios. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a location for many air crashes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Bravo, you're so, so creative. I mean, come on. Who, who could do cool. that? Anyway, so continue. I mean, you know, th this is back in 1974 where it was very, very illegal, and we were playing in Oklahoma City with them, which was even 10 times more illegal, illegal. and dangerous. Yes, yeah. And it didn't seem to phase them at all because I remember we presented it to them in their dressing room. Thank you so much for having, me, having us on, on your tour. <laughs> they said me there for a second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having us on your tour and, you know, all of that stuff. And then we presented it and they were like, oh, wow, that's awesome, great. And they, they, they lit it up. It. Yeah, this was supposed to be for some other time. Yeah, and, and they, they smoked, smoked it before it. they went on stage, like the whole rocket ship. I remember standing at the side of the stage and they're that's playing. Right. I don't remember the guitar player's name, but he was playing and, he, and he, at one point he put his head back like this. <laughs> and stopped playing for about five minutes. <laughs> And then he snapped out of it. It's like, yeah, yes. Yeah, and then he we got went to there. the airport. Yeah, yeah. It was like mission accomplished. Yes. Lurks. Yes. I was proud of that uh, moment. That, that's a great memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. There were a few like that. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, certainly when we were making some records, that was Aggressive the way. Aggressive steel. That's the way we kind of finished the session. We, yeah, yeah. We went you, on a flight. Do you remember making Caress of steel? When you say remember... <laughs> Do you remember how much hash oil we smoked making Caressa yeah. Steel? Yeah, that was the thing then. Yeah. Um, I remember months after we finished the record, listening to it and thinking, where'd all the reverb go? <laughs> I thought yeah, we put a lot of reverb yeah, on that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But, no. but I, I just wasn't high anymore. So <laughs> no. It just sounded very different. No. Do you remember the time we played it for Paul Stanley? Yes. So, so we'd, we were kind of proud of this record, even though it clearly was very weird. Um, the, fountain of, the Fountain of Lamneth and the Necromancer, you know. Um, and we were opening for Kiss, and we took him. Was it in the bus or in the dressing room or something? It was no, we the, didn't have a bus. It was in, the, it was in our uh, fun craft. Our fun craft. Yeah, because we, we had the table. Yeah, we had, that's seats. right. And uh, so Paul came in and we sat down, we were proud of it, we played him the record, and boy, did he look confused. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was so, he was really nice. Yeah. But he looked really scared really? and confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he said, well, you know, I hope this all works out for you. Yeah, yeah. I gotta go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really an album. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> But we were pretty lucky. I mean, there were only a few bands that gave us a hard time yeah. when we were opening. And, uh, you know, even Kiss, in the earliest days, they were really good to us. Yes. And, and it was very rare in those days to get a, even a sound check. Uh, and as we learned, opening for uh, Aerosmith for like two right. months, where we didn't get a single sound Not check. A single. But Kiss did everything they could to make sure we got yeah, a sound always. check. always. So that was, you know, a good lesson in professionalism. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that stayed with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who else? Who else treated us like shit? Let's see. <laughs> There's uh, Aerosmith. Um, well, only at first. Only at first. Uh, and and at and the end. And then later. Yeah, and and in the middle as well. And yeah. then years later again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So but that was okay. You know, they were doing their own thing, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Are, are, are they uh, doing a book tour? No, no, no. I don't think so. No. <laughs> oh, man, I love you. I love you, too. <laughs> I we mean, laughed a lot. This has been going on between us since we were 13. I mean, uh, I mean... If you guys were not here, nothing would be different. No, it wouldn't be. We'd be laughing more, actually. Yeah, we were sitting in the dressing room remembering all kinds of crazy, crazy things just before we came out here. And uh, it's just like that. I'm so happy we have this 
volume of shared memories, you know, and I was really happy to share some of them in the book, but you, I, there's so many. I know. I mean, we're so fortunate. Yeah, you know, we really were. Uh, that we, or are. Uh, are? Yeah, I are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah still are. And uh, I think when Neil joined the band, we discovered kind of a, a fellow traveler, you know, because he had a great sense of humor and he fit right in with us. And within, the f after the first few weeks, which were strange, uh, <laughs> because uh, let's talk about his audition. Shall we talk about his audition? Great, I was going to bring that up. Okay. I'll keep my feet over here then. Um, so, John Rutsey, our first drummer, was a very good drummer, different style of drummer. Uh, solid, uh, not uh, histrionic drum rolls, but really a good solid drummer. And he had sort of more simple rock and roll tastes. And um, we were starting to write and be influenced by bands like Yes and Genesis, and we wanted to make our music more complex. At the same time, we had finished our first album, and there had been some problems making that record, mm -hmm. and, and John, who had, was supposed to be in charge of writing all the lyrics, on the night we were supposed to record the vocals, he didn't show up with the lyrics and tore them all up, and we found, only found that out the next day, and I had to write the lyrics really quickly, so clearly we were at a kind of crossroads with him. And I think he also, because you know, he was diabetic and he had some health issues, health concerns, I don't think he wanted to do this tour that we had planned. That's so right. suddenly we were without a drummer. So we held an audition. Now, I had never been to an audition before. Had you? Uh, not, not for Rush, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I love asking him questions. It's, all, it's so good. Uh, <laughs> and so we held this audition, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing, but we agreed that we wouldn't talk, make any decision, right. till we heard all oh. four drummers. Oh, four. There were four. Were you, were you, were you one of them? <laughs> no. I remember three, but... You remember three? There, Neil, uh, Jerry Fielding, Jerry Fielding and, and the uh, guy with the, the guy, yeah. orange hair. Yeah. You remember yeah. the color of his hair? Yeah. I thought there yeah. was a first guy. That we, I had no memory of him. Well, Jerry, actually, Jerry... He was the first he, guy. He toured with us. He, he, no, no, he played... He yeah, filled I mean, in for, for John for a month or two. Or... I know, I was there. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I recognize you now. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so Jerry came first. Yeah, Jerry, so Jerry was a done deal, and then Neil, and then the, the, the last guy came. Remember he had a, a, a little Volkswagen bug? No, I don't the remember Beatles? his vehicle. Yeah, and he, he had his drums in the, and he brought them out and he set them up. I think he had a, 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 his kick, a snare, a, a yeah, floor tom, yeah. and one tom. Yeah, he had a simple kit and Very he, simple. he wrote charts, he had charts for all the and, songs. But the best part of it is we, we finished, with Jerry left, yeah. and this Ford Pinto pulls up. Right. And this guy who's not wearing a shirt, he's got short hair, and we're laughing at people with short hair. <laughs> yeah. Look how short his hair, this guy's a fucking He doesn't cool. even have any velvet pants. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he hops out of the car, bounds out of the car, he, you know, big, he was yeah. a big, lively cat. And he pulls out these green garbage bags that have drums in them. And he brings them in, he sets up a kit that's two, uh, made out of two, and there was a Rogers kit with two small 18-inch bass drums. And he's setting it up, and Alex and I are looking, who's this fucking goof, man? Yeah, this is not going to work out. Yeah, Maybe he's just put him back in the garbage bags and get out of here. <laughs> and so he tunes the drums, and then he starts playing like... What a show off. Triplets that wouldn't end. Yeah. And I'm really smiling. I'm really excited now because I knew this is fucking magic and so I start talking to him excitedly but you weren't happy no, about it. No, I was like, 
Well, his hair is pretty short. <laughs> And I was breaking the rule. I was talking yeah. to him like he was already in the band. Right. And, and we played through the songs from the first album, and then we played that bit in 7-8 uh, that eventually became the song Anthem. And he had no problem playing that. I mean, yeah. he was just killing it. So I, I was sold, and, and you were like... Yeah, yeah, at, at first. But as the day... Because if you remember, he came relatively early in the morning, I think 11-ish. Uh, and we were there, well, you know. We're musicians. Uh, yeah, really. Yeah. What's the matter with you? <laughs> and we were there till 11 at night, which was still was pretty that? early. Did it go that late? <laughs> yeah, we did go that late. Wow, I Because I think they had a curfew there for 11 o'clock. You know, the whole day we were talking about everything. World events, literature, music. Yeah. We smoked a joint, we had it bite to eat, we played, to yeah, break, play. I remember Neil thinking that you didn't like him because you didn't want to talk about it. And it wasn't until that very polite drummer that followed him where you kind of went, ah, okay. Yeah, well, that was... <laughs> that yeah. other guy was probably better. Yeah, well, I knew he was better, <laughs> and I knew he was great, but I wanted to wait and see. What if the next guy was great as well but had long hair? You know? <laughs> so... You know, you just, you never know. And that was the deal, right? That was we the deal. We had a deal, Wade. I broke the, I broke the deal. <laughs> that was my deal, Wade. So <laughs> I broke the deal because it was fucking Neil Elwood Peart playing our song. Yeah. But then he was that guy. Yeah. So. Uh, he was that guy. But once the audition was, was done and we decided... It felt like he was in the band. Yeah. And then the next week, uh, he came down. We started rehearsing. And then we went to Longham McQuaid's here in Toronto. Yeah. Because we'd gotten our very first ever advance from the record company. And we could go shopping. And so he wasn't even in the band for a week before he got his pick of any drum kit. And I got to buy my Rickenbacker that I had been dreaming about for years. And you bought a Les Paul, I think. A Les Paul and Marshall Amps. Like, was that not the best that day That was ever? the best day ever. I mean, it's like, it's like we won a game show or something. Yeah. You know? Like, if you're a musician and you're young and you go to, the, to, you go to a music store on the weekends or whenever and you just drool and then eventually, once, after you stop crying, you leave. <laughs> That's and, right. and maybe come back a couple hours later and go through that whole process again. So to be there and actually have money in our pocket to buy the equipment that we were I know, drooling over, it was, it, and you know, you know, it was it felt like it was their money, but it wasn't their money, it no. was our money. Yeah. We didn't realize that an advance means an advance on royalties. So it's really, yeah. it was our cash. So. Yeah. But it didn't feel like it. And not at the time. And it, it was it, great. It was awesome. I remember, I can, <laughs> yeah. honestly, I can remember the showroom where the gear was set up. Yeah. It was a sunny day. It was late afternoon. I clearly remember the whole thing. Yeah, me too. And I remember looking at that Ricky bass. I don't know how many times I'd seen one of them hanging on the wall. I never thought I would own one. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was big. And then... A week and a half later, we were on tour together yeah. with this new guy, uh, this the new guy. And, uh, you know, I remember us, the first couple of gigs, we didn't really know him, but he had a great sense of humor and we were laughing a lot. And, and we also had another new guy, Howard, or, who, Hearns, who, who's here tonight. Let's hear it for Hearns. Uh, <laughs> who was our tour manager, and he was an American. He was a New Jerseyite from America. I believe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. And uh, so this was a real education, you know. And the first gig was in Pittsburgh at the Civic Arena. I remember checking. We flew in on an airplane and everything, yeah. taking flights instead of driving. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then it was the first gig, opening for Uriah Heep and Manfred Mann's Earth Band. Yeah. yeah. And we had 26 minutes to play. Right. There was a new venue that, that was a brand new arena that had, you know, a, a retractable, retractable roof. roof. Yeah. 
and we got there, we were so excited, and all the dressing rooms were here, and they, the, whoever came out and said, oh, no, 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 your dressing room is the, down this hall. <laughs> and after about an hour and a half of walking down that hall, we got to the little tiny dressing room. Yeah. But it was still great, and there was yeah. booze in it. There was actual, there was actual was bottle alcohol, of... alcohol. Like yeah, there was free. a bottle of Bloom Nun, I think, and... And some Heineken. Some Heineken, and a deli tray. And, Oof, and wow. my, my half bottle of Southern Comfort. Southern Comfort. Which I ordered for, I don't, I don't know why, but Howard was saying, you know, you can get booze on your rider, so you should order some booze. And I said, I, I don't drink spirits. I didn't really know what to order. And I had read that, uh, you know, a lot of the cool rock Janis bands. Joplin. Janis Joplin. Janis Joplin. And you kind of look like her, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was natural. <laughs> it was natural for you to, you know, want to drink my And so drink. before we went on, I took a shot of this stuff. Yeah. And I was dizzy for the whole 26 minutes we were on stage. I was just like, huh? It's over? Wow. Mm. And that's really the tour we got to know Neil. Yeah. And we saw this alien in our midst, and we were like, hmm, he reads a lot. Hmm, maybe, maybe he wants to write the lyrics. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you think he does? That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> so we said, eventually, we said, hey, you, whatever your name is, you want to write some lyrics for us? <laughs> I think it was a, something as simple as that. Yeah. And we want to give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> And then I think the first song he wrote was Beneath, Between, and Behind. Yeah. And uh, I remember thinking, wow, there's really a lot of words in this song. <laughs> there were a lot of words we in We better song. write a very fast song yeah. to go along with it. Yeah, but, and, because and, that's and, easier for a singer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, I listened to that song, and for the longest time I thought, ah, this song is too fast, this song is too fast. But I listened to it the other day, and you know, it, it, it holds up. It's, it, it, sounded, mm. it sounded okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a cool song, actually. Yeah. And, you know, the song is about, obviously, America, and he was just, you know, channeling all the experiences we were having as a young, a young band. Yep, and that's how he continued. Yeah. He wrote his whole career as a lyricist. Yeah, yeah. He got pretty good at it, I he think. He was not bad. Yeah. He, he did know a lot of words. A lot of words, of course, you eliminated from the songs at in times. the early process. Yes, yes. For, for good reason, yes. by the way. Yeah. But I thought we developed, him and I developed a pretty good relationship yes. yeah. with lyrics. Yeah, I, for sure. I had to express his thoughts, and I had to make them my own. And, and, he, and put them in, 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 in the context of a singer. That's right. That's, that's the other thing, a rock singer. Because I know his lyrics could sometimes be very, very deep, like very wordy, uh, and not, sometimes not easy to get the essence of. Right. Uh, m m maybe too complicated or complex. Well, but, I mean, we had to talk about but it. But that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. You guys talked about it, and you, yeah. you would filter them in, in a way that they sounded like a song, like uh, yeah. lyrics to a song instead yeah, yeah. of from a book or something. But as we grew, as a, you know, the three of us as writing partnerships, uh, you know, I thought he, right from the get-go, was pretty um, objective and ego-free yeah. when we had something to say about a, a lyric that he'd written. And I remember him saying, well, I was happy just to have written it. Uh, if we didn't use it, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't think I would have been so uh, magnanimous uh, yeah. back then about a part if he didn't like it. But, yeah. but we spent so much time in such close company and so much time laughing together yeah. that when it came to work, those things worked themselves out pretty yep. easily, didn't yep. they? Yeah. I mean, it was pretty remarkable. And yeah. he became very open to any suggestions I would have to move, you know, one part of the song here or, or whatnot to change the lyrics, and he would be happy to go back and work it yeah. as long as he didn't lose what he felt was important about the song's theme. And that was really yeah. a beautiful thing to, to be involved in, a yeah. partnership like that. So, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, it was. I remember the first time we went to Europe, how awesome that was. I think in 1976 was the first time we went. Yeah. 
and uh, went to the UK and, and Sweden, and we were <laughs> like we were in, inseparable to, in that whole time. Yeah. We were constantly on the go, late at night, early in the morning. Yeah. When we were in Japan in 1984, remember we we didn't adjust to the time. We'd get up at four o'clock in the morning and meet downstairs, and then go out in the streets yeah, yeah. and walk around in Nagoya for four or five hours. Yeah, it was great fun. Yeah, yeah, lucky. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, grateful. Yeah. What do we do now? Um, Getty, Getty, pardon my interruption. We're not getting any younger. Could you wrap it up now, please? Oh. Oh. Did you know God was British? <laughs> That's God? Sounds just like Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Okay, I guess we gotta... Let's... Maybe I should read something. Well, that'd be great. Now, I, I, have, I have to ask your permission. Sure. I have to ask, because okay. I can read a couple of different excerpts, but one of them... Okay might be a little embarrassing for you. Are you okay with that? I, I've never done anything embarrassing. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to do that. You wait here. I'm going to go read oh, for okay. the folks. All righty. This is something I call pressures of being on the road. It takes place in 1978 in England. It was our second English tour. Uh, and it was touring the album A Farewell to Kings. Our star continued to rise in 78. A Farewell to Kings was generally well received and closer to the heart even broke into the top 40 on UK radio. Who knew? That was the year the Glasgow crowd blew us away singing along with the chorus. The first time anything like that had ever happened to us. We played two nights at the Apollo there, a classic old theater built in 1927 with Corinthian columns and a severe rake on the stage. Now in thespian parlance, a raked stage is one that's tilted toward the audience. Hence the directive, put that downstage left, where I'm standing right now, and where I pretty much spent my entire life. It was also really high, 15 feet, 6 inches to be precise, so that if you stood at the edge, you almost got vertigo. At face level opposite, there was a balcony that had been built to bounce up and down. And I can tell you those Glaswegians knew it. Many bands who had played that place have testified that when the crowd put the bouncy balcony to the test, trampolining with all their might, you stood there in fear that it might surely collapse. The great advantage of playing two nights in the same venue is that the crew doesn't have to pack up and load out after the first show, giving them a night off and us a rare opportunity to unwind together. And so it was on a February night in Manchester in 1978 that we convened in the bar of the Piccadilly Hotel. For a while, Alex had not been very happy. His second son, Adrian, had been born the year before, and he was missing home big time. Out of the blue, he challenged our stage manager, Lurch, a towering man, six foot eleven in height, and with a tough constitution, to a cognac drinking contest. <laughs> now, cognac is usually around 40% alcohol, and it's for sipping. No one in their right mind knocks it back in shots, but I think I counted a dozen rounds. Soon words were slurred, voices were raised, and when a clearly plastered Lurksy triumphantly slammed yet another glass on the table, he shattered it. I looked at Liam, his roadie, and Howard, our tour manager, and said, I think you better get him to his room. So they put their arms around him and suggested it was time for bed, not least because we had another gig to do the following night. Those of us remaining in the bar had a laugh about it and then decided enough was enough for us too. But as we were waiting for the elevator, the doors opened and out flew Alex, <laughs> lying prone on a room service cart. 
cue more lunatic laughter, and once again, Liam and Hearns rounded him up and escorted him to his room, which was next to mine. <laughs> Sitting on my bed, I could hear shunting and crashing through the wall, like he was moving furniture around. I then heard him yelling out to the street, Hey, England, <laughs> you guys are stupid. They're all living a thousand years ago. Hey, you, can you hear me? I opened my window and leaned out and said, Lurks, buddy, go to sleep. It's late. Go to sleep now. Dirk, Dirk, can you believe this? These people are living a thousand years ago. <laughs> yeah, Lurks, I know, but come on, close your window. I closed mine and I began undressing but he kept calling my name. And then I heard more smashing sounds. He torn down the curtains and was soon leaning out his window, tapping on mine with the curtain rod. <laughs> Dirk, Dirk, don't go. <laughs> Open your window. Half naked now, I pulled back my curtains when the pain cracked apart, showering my room and me with splinters of glass. I looked down to see a three-inch triangular shard stuck in my tidy whities <laughs> about an inch from my effing manhood. <laughs> gingerly, gingerly, I removed it and then heard scuffling in the hallway and hubbub all over the hotel floor. So I tiptoed over the broken glass to the door and looked through the peephole in time to get a fisheye view of a nearly naked Alex running down the hallway <laughs> with Hearns and Liam chasing after him. <laughs> they were just hustling him back into the room when two security guards charged out of the elevator and banged on his door. He opened up, the curtain draped over him like a gauzy toga, obstinately denying that he'd been making a disturbance. He slurred and said, well, I just don't give a shit. <laughs> and he spat on one of them. <laughs> yeah, we all cringed mortified. Hearns did his best to placate them, earnestly apologizing and promising to sort it all out. He urged them to talk it over in my room, but when I opened the door, there for all to see was glass strewn across the carpet. Somehow, Hearns got them down to the manager's office, reassuring them of our normally upstanding character and promising to pay for the damages and saved us from being booted out in the middle of the night. While I curled up under the blankets in that room with no window, splinters everywhere, and fell asleep as the cool February air rushed in. <laughs> The next day, poor Al was so embarrassed and humiliated, to put it mildly, and even though we knew it was just one of those things that happens when a person's at breaking point. In a fragile state, we left to do our second show, and when we returned, he went up to each and every employee, shook their hands, and apologized, like a good Canadian boy. <laughs> Perhaps because he was so sincere, they were more than cool about it and even promised to welcome us back next time we were in town. But the following morning, we still left Manchester with our tails tucked between our legs. Thank you. Thank you and you. You, you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Thank you for being a part of my effing life. I appreciate it. Good night.
like an hour. 